we're trying to turn images like this into some sort of a map. That's the idea. And of course, the issue is that we are nestled within the Milky Way galaxy, and we can't fly up above to look down on it to see what it would look like. <coughs> so our best guess is that it looks something like this. It's a spiral galaxy with between two and four arms. I'll show you at the end that we favor four-arm model. It is a barred galaxy as far as we know as well. And a lot of those results are from massive star formation regions. So I put this slide in here to kind of motivate the project. Uh, on the top, you have one of the earliest maps of Europe. You probably can't see it, but it's upside down uh, before they kind of understood north and south. Uh, in the middle there is one of the early maps of the entire world. You can see North America is kind of just getting filled in. And then on the bottom is one of the earliest maps of Mars, where the astronomer at this time, it's not, um, it's not Lowell. I forget who did this map was thinking that the features on Mars were actually water, like standing water, lakes, and flowing rivers. Today we have an amazing picture, of course, of Europe. That's Google Maps there. Here's the entire world. We've mapped this out in incredible detail. That's Google Maps again. Um, and down there is an image <coughs> from one of the orbitals that was going around <coughs> Mars. So we've mapped out the structure of these bodies in extreme detail, we still don't really know how to turn something that looks like this into something that looks like this. So this is kind of a fundamental problem in astronomy that we don't know the structure of our own home Milky Way galaxy. <laughs> so back to kind of a low level again. Uh, on this slide, we have various size scales in the universe. We, of course, live on Earth, which is in the solar system. Uh, the third panel on the top there has the solar neighborhood, actually as an aside, we've been mapping out the structure in the solar neighborhood a lot with the instrument I'm going to talk to you about, the Y satellite. Milky Way galaxy there is on the fourth panel of the top, then the local galactic group, these are the 30 galaxies that kind of constitute our nearest neighbors, Andromeda being the most famous one, Virgo supercluster, local superclusters, and then observable universe. On all of these size scales, we have a pretty good picture of what's going on. But actually, surprisingly, the Milky Way galaxy, we have the least understanding of, of all of these size scales for a variety of observational reasons. So, the easiest thing you can do, of course, and this was done in the 1700s, is to count up all the stars, right? So we have our Milky Way galaxy. Let's put down a grid. And then we'll just count all the stars in that grid box. And we'll do that night after night after night after night after night. It takes forever. There's a lot of stars in the galaxy. <coughs> if the stars in the galaxy are homogeneously distributed, then if you find a box with a lot of stars, that must relate to a large distance through the galaxy. If you find a box with very few stars, that must relate to a short distance in the galaxy. So hopefully, if you count up all the stars like this in your grid, you're going to find some boxes that have lots of stars, those represent long path lengths, and some boxes that have very few stars, those represent small path lengths. So this was done, like I said, in the 1700s. Uh, William Herschel did a fantastic job about this. For you observers, of course, Herschel is one of your heroes. Uh, he's an amazing observational astronomer and composer, among other things. Uh, and he found that amoeba-shaped thing up there, which is almost 100% wrong. <laughs> so this took him years to complete. You have to count up all the stars. And under the assumption, again, that the stars are distributed uniformly in the galaxy, those <coughs> long amoeba legs up there <coughs> are boxes where he had lots and lots and lots of stars. The short amoeba legs are boxes where he had very few stars. The sun, you can see it just up there is that little yellow dot. So he found the sun approximately at the center of this amoeba. Almost the only thing he got correct is that the galaxy is a disk. So it is more or less a two-dimensional structure, kind of like a frisbee. And you're nestled within that two-dimensional structure. In the directions up and down, there's very little 
stellar material or gas material or massive star formation. He got that right. He got the shape otherwise pretty wrong. This was repeated again in 1922 by Kapstein, Dutch astronomer. He figured that instead of this amoeba shape, it was kind of more of an ellipse. Um, also, almost entirely incorrect, he put the sun very near the center again. So, it's kind of surprising that astronomy, with such a long baseline of time, right? People started looking up at the stars as far back as we can trace. First telescope observations were Galileo. It takes a long time to the present day, but we had no idea of some of the fundamentals until recently. So even as recently as 1922, Captain didn't know about one fundamental thing, and that led him to go from something that looks like this, kind of your amoeba, and that is obviously wrong when we look at other galaxies that look kind of like M51. So one of the things that they didn't know is that galaxies like this are outside of our own galaxy. Initially, people thought that these were other nebulae within our own galaxy, so they had no reference for comparison. So the model on the top is not obviously wrong to an astronomer in 1920. <coughs> the Milky Way is more like that spiral than the elliptical, so Captain and Herschel got that one right. Uh, I like to put this quote up at this point in the talk. Uh, we tend to scoff at the beliefs of ancients, but we can't do it personally to their faces. And this is what annoys me. <laughs> this, of course, is Jack Handy, Saturday Night Live, for you old timers. Um, so, why does this work? Maybe some of you guys know. These pictures on the right have one thing in common, and that thing in common is what is causing Herschel and Captain to get the wrong answer. So, of course, dust does two things, right? It reddens everything. You guys have seen this with your stars, right? The stars look red when you look through gas clouds, gas and dust clouds. And the second thing it does is it dims light. So if we go back to our favorite amoeba here, directions <coughs> where Herschel found very few stars could either be due to the fact that there are very few stars, or that there's dust that's obscuring his view of the distant stars. So that's what the problem was. People had no idea about dust, even into the 1920s, which is kind of hard to believe. So on the right there, we have the sun, or that's the moon, sorry. Same phenomenon, though. The moon setting, as it gets towards the horizon, you're going through a longer path length of dust. It gets red and fainter. Same with the setting sun. Of course, the Horsehead Nebula in the middle there. And then our Milky Way, which some of you will be drawn initially to the stars in that image. And some of you will be drawn to the dark patches, which is the dust. So that dust is what we're talking about today. And that was the big problem. So on my research, I use wavelengths that go through the dust. So I'm interested in the structure of our galaxy. If you really want to do the structure of the galaxy, we can essentially do similar work to Herschel and Captain, but at longer wavelengths. So longer being infrared, mid-infrared in this case, out through the radio. At those wavelengths, dust does not impact your observation significantly, and you can see through the entire galaxy. So, what you're looking at right here in the center of this frame is one of the most massive star formation regions in our galaxy. This is W43, it was discovered at radio wavelengths in the 1950s, and it's not apparent because even at this infrared wavelength, dust between us and this region is obscuring our ability to see. So if you go to long enough wavelengths, here is the massive star forming region right there, and it just pops out clear as day. These images, by the way, are from the Spitzer Telescope, which produced some of the best images of massive star formation that we have to date. <clears throat> so this, of course, is M51. You guys have all seen this. Um, the little pink dots are H2 regions. These are regions of ionized gas that surround massive stars, massive stars in this case being about five times the mass of the sun and more massive all the way up to about 100 times the mass of the sun. So around these massive stars, we have intense ultraviolet fields. And those ultraviolet fields can ionize the surrounding hydrogen. 
So by ionizer force, I just mean that it knocks the electrons off of the protons, and then you have a plasma of electrons and protons. So this is a Hubble image of M51, and the pink there is H-alpha <coughs> emission. It's pretty cool, right? Um, what I'm interested in is using these H2 regions, and you can see they trace out the spiral structure. So if we can somehow peer through the dust in our own galaxy, we can make a map of the structure of our galaxy using only these H2 regions. So that's really the thesis that I'm working from. Zooming in, of course, you see some amazing detail. This is one of my favorite images in all of astronomy, actually. You can download it from hubblesite.org and play around with it. So you see some of the detail here. Here you have an open cluster, and then, of course, all of that pink stuff is hydrogen alpha from H2 regions. The wavelengths I use, though, are, of course, not optical. Hubble's primarily an optical instrument, some near infrared. Um, that can't see through the entire disk of the galaxy. These same images, or these same regions here, are imaged at infrared wavelengths. So this is the color scale that I'm going to be using in subsequent slides. In green, what you're looking at is kind of the boundary of the stellar radiation field. So the stars in the trapezium have created a cavity. That cavity is seen in red, and what you're looking at in that case is hot dust. So it's dust that's maybe 100 Kelvin, so hot for, for me, hot for an infrared astronomer. The green there is kind of the boundary between the ambient medium that's surrounding the regions and the hot gas and dust inside. What's not pictured here is what's doing the H-alpha emission. H-alpha emission is from a plasma of electrons and ions. That's coincident with the red there. So that red emission is coincident with the plasma, although this wavelengths, they look the same. It's slightly <coughs> different emission mechanism. So once again, here's Orion with Hubble. And you can make this image, of course, with your telescope, probably. You had nice seeing. This one is with WISE. This WISE is a little telescope. We'll get to that in a second. It operates at infrared wavelengths. And you get complementary information, actually, and the benefit of peering through all of the dust. So this is WISE. It's the little telescope that could. It's about a meter across. Um, it surveyed the entire sky many, many times throughout its mission. In fact, it did nothing but survey the sky. So most telescopes in astronomy, you have the ability to propose, and you say, I want X number of hours to observe Orion at these wavelengths with this telescope. WISE didn't operate like that. It just surveyed the entire sky. They maintain also a public website where you can download pretty images. So I encourage you to check that out. It's just W-I-S-E. And this image here is the galactic plane. So. The galactic center is at the center of this image. And then increasing galactic longitude, which is the coordinate system we use, is towards the left, and then it wraps around like this. So this is the entire sky projected onto an egg, basically, like some of those old world maps. So I'm interested in this image in the regions of intense emission that are green, just like our last image here of Orion. So we're trying to find Orion analogs throughout the entire galaxy. This slide is rather technical, but we can just look at the pretty pictures and the, some of the dashed lines. Um, H2 regions are ionized, like I said, by very massive stars. And we have, in astronomy, of course, a spectral type <clears throat> ranging from O3 is kind of the most massive stars that you ever find, down to B0, which is kind of the low range of a star that can create an H2 region. So everything in M51 surrounded by pink has at its center one of these giant stars. On this plot, on the y-axis, you're looking at how bright it's going to be, and then as a function of distance on the x-axis, and you see the y's limit is way, way down there. So it's kind of technical for this talk, but the point of this slide is just that y's, the infrared emission from these H2 regions, y's can detect everything in the entire galaxy. So if we're really patient, we could, in principle, make a catalog of all the star forming regions in the entire galaxy. So that's what we did. So I hired a team of about a dozen 
of my favorite undergrads, and we looked for Orion analogs, like we had a couple slides ago. This is an image of the Perseus spiral arm, actually. Um, some of you may know some of these objects. Uh, this is Sharpless something or other, <laughs> I guess. I'm not good at my Sharpless. 3, W4, and W5 over there. Um, it's towards the outer galaxy, so there's not, it's not as complicated as some of our fields. So we went through and we looked for all of the red emissions surrounded by green emission, like we saw in Orion, and we found about 8,400 objects. So this is a catalog that, in principle, contains all the massive star formation regions in the whole galaxy. We color-coded them. That's not so important for our talk today. So these are infrared detections. All we have is a location and a brightness. We want to turn that into a distance, of course. Here's some pretty, pretty examples. These are, again, from Spitzer, although we did the catalog from WISE data. They're basically the same wavelength. That's kind of what they look like. They kind of look like little bubbles, just like Orion, where you have ionized gas that's surrounded by each, or sorry, surrounded by green emission. <clears throat> so this took a long time, of course. Uh, my poor undergrads were working really hard on this. And 8,400 objects is a lot to do by eye. In fact, it's right at the level where I was contemplating writing a computer, computer code to do this. But we powered through it. And uh, you can compare these images here with the Y's image before that was projected onto the A. So along the galactic plane, remember our galaxy is thin like a frisbee. That's where all of our star formation is going to be found. So like I said, we want to turn those infrared positions into three-dimensional positions with distances. The way we do that is by going to a radio facility. So this is me uh, about 10 years ago when I started this work. And the best radio facility for this is right in Pocahontas County, West Virginia. It's the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, On site, there's about a dozen di different radio telescopes and research facilities. Um, and it's just kind of one of our pure science facilities in America. It's surrounded by a 100 mile radio quiet zone where there are no cell phone towers pointed towards the observatory. There are no AM or FM radios pointed towards the observatory. And on site, they even shield microwave ovens by building basically Faraday cages around them. So they can't get any microwave radiation at all. Microwaves operate at about two to three gigahertz, which is a very sensitive range for this telescope. So with the GBT, we can measure a spectral line and if the source is coming towards us, that line will be blue shifted. If the source is going away from us, the source is going to be red shifted. And with that red shift, blue shift information, and a model for how the galaxy rotates, <coughs> we can determine the three-dimensional location of every object that we measure. The sun in this image is at the top. This is our best idea of what the galaxy would look like if we were able to fly up above it, which we can. So we see the spiral arms there are delineated with stars and dust, those black dust lanes. You see the galactic center in the middle. And you see that we have a large-ish bar that's running at about 45 degrees in this image. Top is where the sun is located, not in the center, right? If you're obscured by dust, like Herschel and Captain, then dust is going to eventually obscure everything. We're going to put the sun in the center. We know today that the sun's about two-thirds of the way out in the disk of the galaxy. <clears throat> so one of the things that we were very interested in is this recently discovered outer arm of the galaxy. So I've confusingly switched the orientation. Sorry about that. The sun's now at the bottom. And we were interested in the red box there. Within that red box is the most distant known molecular spiral arm in the galaxy. We're going to trace star formation way, way out in the whole galaxy and prove that our method really works. We better find a little star formation out there. <clears throat> and we did. Um, this one, again, is a little bit confusing, but these are the locations of our sources along the spiral arm. On the bottom panel, we have turned the Doppler shift into a velocity moving towards and away from us. 
The red stars are our five detections. On the top panel, we have two position coordinates, latitude and longitude. So the point of this slide is that we found five regions that are forming massive stars in the most distant spiral arm ever discovered. This is more than 50,000 light years from the galactic center, and it's more than 75,000 light years from <coughs> the sun. Very, very far away. So our method worked, and we were able to prove that we can really detect star formation at the extreme <coughs> edge of the galaxy, just to give you guys a little sense for what we're looking at every day. On the left is the WISE image. You can see that it kind of looks like Orion if you moved Orion way, way, way to the other side of the galaxy. On the top right is a radio image, which is basically what we're working from. And then on the bottom is our Doppler shifted spectrum. We've turned the x-axis into a velocity based on the magnitude of that red or blue shift. The most recent survey is in green that is unpublished. You guys are rare few to see this slide. Um, the red and the black are various iterations of previous surveys. <coughs> So in green you see that we are really tracing star information on the extreme outer edge of the disk down there, and that was the goal of this recent survey. And we're starting to see some hints of galactic structure. Of course, there are errors in our measurements, and there are errors in our model for how the galaxy rotates, so the structure gets smeared out a little bit. But with these data, we hope to be able to trace the structure of our galaxy in much greater detail than what has been previously done and what is on this map. You can see one glaring omission here, and that's kind of the left side of this diagram. The left side of the diagram is not observable from the northern hemisphere. None of your Messier objects will inhabit that region of the galaxy. <clears throat> so we have to go to Australia, and we have time to do that beginning this summer. We hope to repeat this experiment with some of the Australian telescopes. There. With our big catalog, which I'll plug at the end again, uh, we have all massive star formation in the whole galaxy, so we can really start to trace different aspects of galactic structure. Some of the questions that interest us are how big is our galaxy, <coughs> how many spiral arms are there, and the warp of our galaxy. I'll explain what that means in a second. So, how big is the galaxy? Well, we can't count stars, like we talked about before. Um, what we can use, though, is galactic rotation, because the speed of an object is related to how much mass is inside of that object in the galaxy. This is true, actually, in a planetary system as well. So if the sun were more massive, the Earth at its present location would have a different period around it. Um, the sun's orbiting around everything closer to the galactic center, so everything interior to the sun's orbit is what counts. So if we're able to determine how fast everything is going in the galaxy, then we can kind of make a map of the mass distribution. <clears throat> this is really not our original research. People have been doing this for many, many years. And when they do that, they find that the Milky Way galaxy is moving around at about 220 kilometers per second. On the x-axis here is distance from the galactic center. So what this is telling us is that everything in the galaxy is moving at about 220 kilometers per second, regardless of its location. So like I said, this is not our original work. This has been known for some time. This is actually our strongest indication of dark matter in our galaxy and in local galaxies. What we would expect, for example, from our solar system is that the interior planets go faster, so the interior stars in the galaxy would go faster, and then as you move out, the stars or the planets, whatever your model, are going to slow down. The fact that we do not see that means that the mass must be increasing as you leave the center of the galaxy. <clears throat> We don't see that mass increasing in visible matter, so it's proposed dark matter must be the cause of this. Dark matter, of course, is some mysterious particle that contributes only through its gravitational interaction. It does not interact with light in any way. 
<clears throat> so people have done this with H2 regions, actually, and we hope to kind of revise that work. It's in progress. Um, and the most recent results showed that the H2 regions in our galaxy are moving around faster than everybody thought. Again, the faster something moves around, the more mass must be interior to it. And so this came out a few years ago, and they found that the mass interior to the sun suggested that our galaxy was very similar to Andromeda. So it was previously thought that our galaxy was kind of a smaller sister of Andromeda, but they're actually very equal sizes. And that was from H2 region rotations primarily. Spiral arms. All right, so this is something that is very interesting, and we can directly test this in a much better way than the previous result. Um, galaxies tend to have an even number of spiral arms, and that's because nature really likes symmetry, it likes to have symmetric galaxies. Uh, even our big bar spiral, NGC 1300, that I had previously, has two massive arms, one on the top and one on the bottom. Our galaxy, if you look at the stars, has two spiral arms. There's two very clear spiral arms if you look at the distribution of stars in our galaxy. Similar to what Herschel and Kapteyn did, but at longer wavelengths, so they were able to count stars out to much greater distance. If you look at the gas and dust, though, and even the mass of star formation, we've shown that there's actually four spiral arms. So there's two in the north in our previous image, and two in the south. <clears throat> the reason why it's better to look at gas, dust, and star formation is that spiral arms are actually very mild overdensities in stars, 5 or 10% only. Whereas in gas and dust, they are 50% overdensities. So if you really want to trace spiral structure, I'm going to argue that you want to do that with something that is going to show that overdensity, like star formation or gas, dust, something like that. And stars are actually probably not the best way to do it. If you have the advantage of a face-on galaxy, where you can look down on it, like our friend M51 here, on the right there is molecular gas map of M51. And you can see the spiral structure just jumps out at you in that gas map. Whereas if you look only at the stars in the left-hand image, which is hard to do, but only the stars, not the H2 region, not the dust, the structure can be kind of tough to discern. So, We've been using H2 regions to trace out the uh, mass of star formation mass. <clears throat> we do that in this diagram. This is another kind of high level diagram. Um, this is a longitude velocity diagram. What you're looking at is position along the x axis versus how fast something's moving away from us, just the Doppler shift, redshift, blue shift on the y axis. This diagram, if you kind of squint your eyes and spend your life looking at this like I do, has features in it that, are, that look kind of linear, so you can kind of connect the dots in this. The way you connect the dots strongly implies that there are four distinct spiral arms in our galaxy, <coughs> and not the two spiral arms that are suggested from star counts. By the way, just connecting a couple of these figures, the right-hand side of this is the part of the diagram that's difficult to observe from the Northern Hemisphere. So that's the part that we hope to do. And you can see the left-hand side is very much more filled in than the right-hand side. So four arms for sure. That one we're very sure of. <clears throat> and the last topic is the warp. So what you're looking at is instead of a face-on view like the Frisbee like this, is an edge-on view where you've taken the disk of the galaxy and you're looking along the disk. On this galaxy, you see very prominently dust lanes, like our own galaxy has. That's why Herschel couldn't get the right answer. So we have dust lanes, and those dust lanes are found predominantly in spiral arms, we imagine, from images of other galaxies. This galaxy, though, has a very prominent warp to it, so that if you look in some directions, the galaxy is warping out above the nominal flat part of it, and if you look at other directions, the galaxy is warping down towards southern parts. Our own galaxy has been known to do this for some time, but nobody's yet traced it in star formation in the directions that we're looking. So 
on this map, what you're looking at is if you took a slice through our galaxy, so it's like one half of this image here. So imagine you're looking at one half of this image, you've just taken a slice, and you can see that along the y-axis is how far above the plane the regions are found. Along the x-axis is distance from the center of the galaxy. And you can see that as you go out from the center of the galaxy, the regions are found at higher and higher positions. So using our, li our large catalog and all these observations, we're able to trace the fact that our galaxy is warping above the plane uh, very substantially as you go out from the center. This one here is a similar plot. Um, just look at the curve there. The curve is going up. The x and y axes are essentially the same, and that's actually molecular gas. So that's the dust component. Um, so it's very reassuring that we see exactly the same thing in star formation. This result's only going to get stronger, too, as we complete more and more surveys. So we'll really be able to nail down how much the galaxy is warping and the parameters of that warp. All right, so that basically concludes the research part, part of my talk, but I wanted to plug our website. Um, so at astro.phys.wvu.edu slash wise, we have the catalog. So I built this site using Google Maps um, and custom tiles. This is wise data. So what you're looking at is the galactic plane there. And then along the bottom are all of the H2 regions in our catalog, all 8,400 of them various Google Maps type things on here. Uh, this is Spitzer data, which is better than WISE. It's higher resolution, but it covers less of the sky, which is why we use WISE in the first place. Um, but it's actually kind of fun, and it may give you ideas for other things to do, because all of this stuff is freely available. Google Maps, you can make your own. No, whatever you want. I've seen various video game maps or you know, anything you want, you can put on a Google Maps type interface. So it's kind of fun. Various search items and whatnot. You can zoom in. The data quality here, these are all public data. I've done nothing except for just put them online. So it's really cool to play with. And we have many wavelengths that you can specify. And we're constantly adding more all the time. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Thank you all for your attention.